Tatiana, and hello everyone. We're glad you could join us today to discuss Enterprise's 2017 Request for Letters of Interest Funding Opportunity. Uh, as Donna said, I'm Kate Diffender for a Senior Grant Specialist here at Enterprise. And I'll be leading you through the presentation today along with our other grant specialists, Teresa Crane and Diane Westcott, as well as Elise Woods, our Contract Administrator, and Lisa Piorota, our Director of Grants and Contracts. We're also joined by Dwayne Marsh, VP of Strategic Capacity Building at the Center for Social Inclusion, and you'll be hearing from him later on in the presentation. Purpose of today's webinar is to provide a general overview of the Section 4 grant program, the LOI application process, and its requirements. And then at the end, we'll give everyone a chance to ask questions. Uh, before we officially get started, I have to note that any content in today's presentation that appears discrepant from the language in the LOI is superseded by the language in the LOI. A little bit about enterprise community partners for those who may not be familiar with us. Here's a picture of our founder, Jim Rouse, and enterprise's mission is to create opportunity for low and moderate income people through affordable housing in diverse, thriving communities. the Section 4 program. So funds for this grant program is through the Department of Housing and Urban Development Section 4 Capacity Building for Community Development Program, which we'll refer to as Section 4 from here on out. Purpose of the Section 4 program is to enhance the technical and administrative capabilities of community development corporations, or CDCs, housing development organizations, CHOTOs, and organizations serving Native American populations with a defined mission that includes affordable housing and includes tribes, tribally designated housing entities, or housing authorities. And Section 4 grant funds are used to build their capacity to carry out community development and affordable housing activities for the benefit of households with low income, which for the purposes of this program uh, are defined as 80% AMI or below. To be considered eligible for funding, applicants must meet the eligibility requirements that are described in Appendix A of the LOI. And there are two requirements here. There's HUD-specific requirements that, again, limit grant funding under the Section 4 program to CDCs, CHOTOs, and organizations serving Native American populations. Enterprise requires that applicants have demonstrated staff capacities to successfully manage a federal grant award inform the proposed grant activities. Demonstrated staff capacity means that your organization has staff, either full-time, part-time, or contracted, and that they're handling the day-to-day -day organizational duties and have the relevant experience to oversee and implement projects and programs. Consider organizations that rely solely on volunteers, donated staff, board members, or consultants as not having demonstrated staff capacity. Um, and if for whatever reason your organization falls into that category and doesn't have the staff capacity, you have the option to partner with a fiscal agent or a fiscal sponsor. And just something you should be aware of, if your organization is invited to submit a full proposal, you'll be asked to identify the organization who will be serving as your fiscal agent or fiscal sponsor. And you can find more uh, information about the roles of agents and sponsors on page 20 of the LOI. If you're still unsure if your organization's uh, eligibility, uh, about your organization's eligibility, we encourage you to view our eligibility requirements tutorial, which is on our grants website, or send us an email at rfp at enterprisecommunity.org. Some general information about the letters of interest funding opportunity. It's a step application process consisting of a letters of interest phase, which we're in right now, and then full application phase. We're in applications from organizations nationwide. However, priority will be given to the eligible organizations working in the 13 market areas, which we've identified in LOI on page 13. Our anticipated awards are ranging from $25,000 to $100,000, with the average award expected to be around $40,000 a grant, the period of performance will begin on September 1st, 2017, and will general, or 
we'll have a general duration of 12 to 24 months. All the documentation that you need to submit your application available on our website. And we recommend that applicants read through the entire LOI as well as the available resource documents before submitting an application. And we'll read those available resource documents later on in the presentation. Some other things uh, that you need to be aware of, apps may only submit one application. You may apply under one program area. And lastly, any applicants that have active awards or pending applications with other Section 4 intermediaries, which include LISC and Habitat for Humanity International, will receive funding for the same cost under this LOI. the LOI, we have six program areas, building and designing sustainable communities, equitable transit-oriented development, housing, affordable housing production and preservation, organizational sustainability, and the Rural and the American Initiative. As before, Enterprise has identified 13 market areas with defined geographic areas for each. These market areas include Boston, the Chicago metro area, Denver, Detroit, the coast, mid-Atlantic, New York City, Northern California, Ohio, Pacific Northwest, rural American, Seaseast, and Southern California. So uh, we ask you carefully review the definition of each market's geographic area, which is on pages 13 and 16 in the LOI. For example, here, Ohio's geographic area focuses only on Franklin and Cuyahoga counties. So it has identified the program areas that they're most interested in supporting. If you are a, an applicant that's interested in applying under rural and Native American, you should be aware that all of the program area titles for that uh, program area begin with rural and Native American and specific to this market area only. And really important to remember, as applicants are required to select one program area to apply under during the application submission process. And we'll talk more about that later on. So um, the marks in those 13 areas, again, provided um, some additional information about their specific program area priorities, priority supplement. It also includes any additional criteria or if a program area is really limited to a particular uh, geography. Here a little note, yesterday we sent out an amendment to the LOI to provide clarity around the program area priorities for select markets. And those markets are Chicago, Denver, Detroit, Gulf Coast, New York, Northern California, Southeast, and Southern California. So if you're an applicant applying under one of those markets, we invite you to head to our website and click on the, um, the LOI again just to see what those changes are. The pretty supplement also includes an enterprise contact for each market and if applicable, um, details about any Q&A sessions that they may be having outside of this one. So we're going to use just uh, the Chicago metro area here as an example. You can see that they've selected or identified seven counties in the Chicago metro area as their geographic area of interest, and then they've listed two uh, program areas of interest. But as I mentioned before, it's important to look at their priority supplement. So again, you can see here, there's contact information for the Chicago metro area. More information about their program areas of interest. And you'll hear, too, that there's a note that says that they prioritize the program areas listed below in the table with equitable transit-oriented development and building and designing sustainable communities. However, they accept applications that address all of the other program areas listed in the LOI. So if you're an applicant in the Chicago metro area and you have a compelling health and housing application, they can accept it. For our rural and Native American applicants, this applies to you only. Um, so 
So if you're interested in applying under rural and Native American, funding is available to eligible applicants that are operating in rural areas across the nation. Most areas to be served must meet HUD Section 4 definition of rural, which is posted here, but you can also reference on page 12 of the LOI. And if you're unsure if the area where your proposed grant activities will take place qualifies as rural, you can visit the website shown here. Uh, it's also on page 12 of the LOI, and enter your zip code or city to check. I'm turning things over to Teresa Crane. Thank you, Kate. Now that we have covered a brief overview of the grant, eligibility, our geographic areas and priorities, you may be asking yourself, how do I apply? We have an online system through our website where applicants must submit the letter of interest. If you'd like to follow along right now to become familiar with it, you can. So access it and go to enterprisecommunity.org forward slash grant. Once there, scroll down and you'll see the subheading under HUD section for grants called Required Application Materials. This is the section that I'll be talking about. Everything that you need to apply can be found here. This includes the LOI narrative, which is Exhibit A, or online submission form with questions, including a required field for attaching your letter of interest. Next slide. Our narrative is a Word document, so you can type in your answers. Make sure to save the document to your own files. We allow formatting changes. Uh, this includes the LOIs may not exceed the pages in length. The instructions sheet on the first page of the LOI can be removed. It must be submitted in Times New Roman 12-point font with one-inch mar margins and single-line spacing. All questions must be properly numbered one through five. And you can submit the narrative in a Word document, and please do not submit as a PDF. If your narrative exceeds our page limit, only the first three pages will be reviewed. Letters that do not follow these instructions and formatting requirements will not be reviewed. To ensure that we're keeping the process fair. You need to upload the LOI narrative through the online submission form. Talk more about the online submission form. This should not be started until after you are done with the LOI narrative because you cannot save your work in the online form, which means there's no way to get back to it later. To applicants, we created an LOI submission guide. It's located in that same section of our website that I was telling you about. And click on the LOI online submission form questions hyperlink. It includes a preview of the online form and instructions for applying. So on our website at this time, I ask that you direct your attention back to the slides. You must all questions in the LOI, and you'll upload your LOI narrative. And you can see here on the slide, there's a screenshot of where you'll be uploading it. If it's about the online form questions, next slide, please. So if you're required to select a market area of interest, here, if an organization is not operating in a defined geographic area for a particular market, select other as the market area of interest. Uh, sample, if an organization is operating in Illinois but is outside of the Chicago metro area's defined geography, you'll, you'd select other. Um, applicants are required to select one program area of interest to apply under. And as mentioned before, rural and Native American applicants must select a program area of interest that aligns with, that begins with rural and Native American. Then you hit submit. One nice feature to note is that for the online form, if you miss a question, an error will pop up to let you know which question was not answered. 
deadline to submit your LOI through the online form is by 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on May 31st. The online form will be closed promptly at that time. For those of you in other parts of the country, that's 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain, and 5 p.m. in Pacific Daylight Savings Time. We will not accept any late submissions or LOIs that are not submitted through our online system. Now to cover the application process, I will hand it over to Grant Specialist Diane Westcott. Teresa, hi everybody, and thank you for attending today's webinar, and we're really glad that you could join us. So we're going to review the threshold requirements that your organization must meet to apply for this grant opportunity. Um, first, your proposed activities must address the needs of low-income households as required under the Section 4 program. And for the purposes of this funding opportunity, Low income is defined as 80% average median income or lower. Low income households is defined as a single person who may be elderly, displaced, disabled, near elderly, or any other single person, a group of persons residing together, or any persons occupying a housing unit. Applicants must meet eligibility requirements, as Kate mentioned, as described in Appendix A of the LOI, and you can refer to the eligibility requirements tutorial on Enterprise's website on our grants page for more information. A tutorial video is presented by me and should be quite helpful, and the slides are also available for reference. Please remember that applications that do not meet both of these filled requirements will not be reviewed. So let's go over the scoring criteria. Applications will be evaluated against four criteria. Each question in the LOI narrative aligns with the criteria, and questions will be graded on a five-point scale, with one being a minimal response and five being an exceptional response. So it's straightforward. Decisions to move an applicant forward are based on eligibility, responsiveness to criteria, aligned with identified priorities and comments from reviewers. The, to the total number of applicants selected to submit a application is contingent upon the number and quality of LOIs received. Criteria one addresses how the proposed program aligns with enterprise funding area priorities. We evaluate how the proposed activity aligns with one of the funding priorities the funding priorities as described in the LOI. The activity clearly identifies the capacity building needs of the applicant and how the grant will address those stated needs. Criteria two addresses the impact of your proposal. We're going to evaluate how the application has significant impact to the capacity of the organization. So going to look at how the application presents significant impact to the needs of low-income households, again, 80% AMI or lower, and communities served. We're going to evaluate how your application describes the capacity of the applicant and rele relevant organizational experience. So we're going to look at how the, applica how the application describes and the organization demonstrates housing or community development experience of the organization, for example, housing units and or commercial square footage developed, and quality asset management, and uh, as relevant to the proposed activities in your proposal. So criteria four addresses the very important issue of racial equity. And within this criterion, we will evaluate if an applicant is addressing or planning to address racial equity in a significant and impactful way. For example, um, you choose to identify the current equity challenges to your, pro your current programs, systems, and communities. You could also, for example, describe current and planned initiatives advancing racial equity and or proposed or ongoing changes to internal policies and procedures. Applicants can also include desired short and long-term outcomes related to the racial equity to help us understand the aims of your efforts. 
Now, another way that you could choose to address this racial equity issue is, as applicable, you could identify the organizational capacity building needs around racial equity and describe how the grant will address your needs. This time, I'd like to reintroduce Dwayne Marsh, who is the Vice President of Strategic Capacity Building at the Center for Social Inclusion. And Dwayne will further address the racial equity criterion, so please take it away, Dwayne. Great. Thanks so much, and thanks to everyone who's joined the conversation. I think that was a, a great, straightforward definition of how the electoral will be scored in the LOI. We did step back, and for those who have been uh, part of the, the Section 4 program for some years, you'll know that this is a new conversation that's emerged over the last year or two. And so we wanted to give some context to help you understand how to think about addressing this criteria. This was introduced in the LOI stage, and uh, there was a lot of response from the, the field of applicants. Uh, Enterprise took time to review that feedback and really study the data. They learned that a vast majority of the applicants to Section 4 actually have the opportunity to advance racial equity outcomes because of the work in which you focus. And they started to understand that connection better and see how what the potential was for Section 4 work to influence racial equity outcomes. And so this is a, a chance to do that without making the application more burdensome. They did want to make sure that they were more specific in the language about what they were trying to request so people could more clearly articulate that work. So this work continued to find its way into the Section 4 pro process. I think uh, just by definition, I think the LOI includes a definition of racial equity that is uh, both from the work that we've done, but also the work of Policy Lincoln helps to frame that out. Uh, it recognizes historical influences on the communities in which you work. We have to have systemic approaches to try to address those things. Knowledge is that in fact, we have uh, deep economic impacts from having racial inequities in our communities and that the kind of work that Section 4 applicants do can actually address those. And that happens, that can be at the neighborhood level, it could be at the middle level, but ultimately it costs our nation in terms of uh, lost economic opportunity and access for people. The hope is that by looking at this issue and how you as applicants have said, we can start close the gap on racial inequities that we know exist in all areas of work from life to death, from infant mortality to life expectancy. And so how you think about these issues of equity in your work being articulated in the application, we think will um, help the program move forward. Uh, ultimately, it's about closing gaps so that race doesn't predict one's success and improving outcomes for everyone as a consequence. And so how you can articulate that as you uh, frame up your LOI will be helpful to the reviewers to think about um, how they approach that. Finally, it acknowledges that these things are structural and that the work that you're doing works to influence those structures. And so to the degree that you're able to describe how your work will influence structures that impact racial equity um, will be helpful for the value where you are. Ultimately, the question of who benefits and who's burdened by the, the investments you make and the opportunities that you put forward to improve outcomes for all people, particularly those marginalized by systemic structures, are the things that we're hoping you'll be able to share as you do this work. And it's important to note that because this is a capacity building grant, articulating your intends to improve your ability to do this work is also a way in which you can be um, evaluated for your contribution to this scoring criteria. I think with that, I'll pass it back so you guys can continue to explain the process. Uh, this is Diane again, and, and just before we move on to our uh uh, our timeline and important dates. I just wanted to mention that on Friday, April 28th, Enterprise, in collaboration with Duane, held a um, national uh, webinar on racial equity. And the, uh, the recording for that entire presentation is available on the Enterprise website um, in our Enterprise Resource Center. So you, you can find it there. It was very interesting, and we we suggest that uh, people take time to, to um, do that. So now we're going to go to um, the last few slides, which really are kind of housekeeping items, but are very important to note. So the first is um, important dates. As the submission deadline for the LOI application, as we've said several times, because it's very important, the magic date and time, is May 31st at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Highly recommend 
that you plan to submit your application one business day in advance just in case any technical difficulties arise during the online submission process. This is very rare, but we make sure that, that no one misses out on the opportunity to apply. Uh, applications will not be accepted past 8 p.m. Eastern, even if there are last minute technical issues during the submission process. So that's why we recommend that you plan to submit a day in advance, if at all possible. So notice of invitation to submit the full applications will be sent via email on July 10th. And the uh, submission deadline for full applications will be on August 7th at 10, 8 p.m. <laughs> Eastern Time Sharp. Uh, please remember that your organization must be invited by Enterprise to submit a full application during this second phase. Kate mentioned previously, we have numerous and helpful LOI materials and resources available on our website. So you can uh, get all the important LOI documents on our gr the grants page on the Enterprise website, including the most recent amendment, which Kate mentioned was emailed out this morning. Your organization should review the available resource documents, such as the LOI submission guide, the letter of interest, FAQ, and the full application and grant award requirements. Also, um, it's really important to note that this presentation has been recorded and will be available on the Enterprise website in about a, a day or two. So uh, here's a full range of the online resources for our LOI applicants and all of these are on our Enterprise website grants page. So let's go through the reminders. Again, um, as Kate mentioned, applicants may only submit one proposal. Applicants must also apply under only one program area. And I know there's a lot of onlys here. Enterprise will only consider LOIs from applicants that have met both threshold requirements, followed instructions, met requirements, and answered all five questions on the LOI narrative, which is Exhibit A, uh, must have submitted their application via the LOI online submission form, and submitted their application by, once again, May 31st at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. And the LOI submission form will close at that time. Submissions and hard copies of application materials will not be accepted, and applications submitted outside of the submission form will not be accepted. Now, you may have questions, and we completely understand that. So, questions that are specific to a particular market or geographic location should be sent to the enterprise contact listed on the market priority supplement. Uh, general questions about the LOI may be submitted to our RFP mailbox, which is rfp at enterprisecommunity.org. And our entire grants team constantly monitors that inbox, and the team members will promptly respond to your questions, I promise. A letter of interest FAQ list will be updated and posted on Enterprise's website every Friday through May 21st. Sorry, I correct myself, 26. Questions will not be added uh, to the letter of interest FAQ list after May 30th. It's important to note that we'll be asked to get in questions um, and disseminate information through the mailbox on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We will be taking the most compelling um, information and answers and, and compiling those into an up updated FAQ. Once again, any questions, please, any general questions, please send to our RFP mailbox and we will get to you with answers. Um, so, now we've finished the formal, formal presentation. We're going to open up the 
a session to questions and answers. Um, please note that due to the volume of the participants, uh, we may not be able to answer every question, but we will definitely try our best. Um, if we don't happen to get to your question, please feel free to submit it through the RFP mailbox and we will get back to you. Terrific, Dan, and we are getting some great questions in the Q&A box. So let's start it. Our first question is, can you host with an organization that is made up of CDCs, such as a housing and community development network? So we have one instance round of, uh, of that type of collaboration, and uh, usually what what we see is one CDC amongst the group taking lead. At um, the requirements, uh, our award requirements uh, dictate that we um, award money only to one organization. So if a CDC in that group can take the lead um, and work with the other other groups on the proposed activities and you know to to perform the work um, that's that's the way that that would probably work best okay next question can rural and Native American organization apply to either a rural area or a Native American area or, or it does it have to be both um, are you on the on the line there Yeah, I was muted. Uh, yeah, so it can be it can be either or. In our application portal, you don't you don't choose rural or Native American. It can be one or the other. It's just one portal to apply for rural and Native American. Okay. Next question is: are prioritized by geographic areas of interest, but LOIs from areas out side of those identified markets can still be submitted, correct? Yes. Correct. Okay. Nitchin, if you are a current Enterprise Section 4 awardee, we received our award in 2016. Can you apply during this cycle for a different program area and in a different geography? You can still apply under this funding opportunity. Um, Don, read the last part of the question again, please. Uh, sure. Can you still apply during the cycle for a different program area and in a different geography? So I would guess um, if you're applying under geography, as long as um, you're operating within that defined geographic area, then yes. Okay. Uh, this organization is a nonprofit in a rural community, but not a native community. Can they still apply? They can still apply. Okay. Let's see. Again, on the rural and Native American, should projects located in rural areas as defined by zip code only apply for the rural and Native American program area? In other words, what's defined with the definition of rural area or? You can actually, so you could apply for under the Rural and Native American Initiative, but you could also apply under a specific geography. I think you have to make that, that distinction, but you could, you could technically apply under either. But if it's a rural project, I would encourage you to apply under the Rural and Native American Initiative. Our next question, the program area affordable housing production and preservation seems to be oriented only toward preservation. Can applications proposing new production apply under this area? Yes, that is an eligible activity. So if your application is focused on production, please application, that's eligible. Okay. Next 
question. 98% of the population we serve are very low and low income African American residents. What does racial equity look like for us? I think what you want to articulate is how your work actually can create better outcomes for people who have been marginalized. And in this case, if you're dealing with very low income African American population, there's a high likelihood that they've been they've faced uh, structural discrimination or other things that have blocked their access to opportunity. So, I think how you think your work will support them close that gap gap with a, a good way to start explaining how you think you'll be addressing racial equity through your application. Thanks, Dwayne. To be considered eligible, does an organization have to be a CHODO in the area of the proposed grant activity, or is any CHODO certification of the organization sufficient? A certification is sufficient. Okay. Uh, several questions on Florida. Uh, asking for clarification, if the geographic boundaries for Florida are Miami-Dade County, Broward County, and Orlando, does this mean that we are not eligible to apply if our service area is Palm Beach County? So, if there are organizations operating outside of the defined geographic area for the southeast, you could still apply. Um, but as we mentioned, um, you would select other as your market area of interest. With an application form, right? Okay. Uh, in the P, there is the statement, through this funding, Enterprise will provide funding that supports a strong housing delivery system and creation and prevention of housing in high opportunity communities. The question is, how do you define high opportunity communities? Give a on that one. You could um, email the RFP at enterprise.org um, mailbox. We will get you that information. I just don't have it in front of me right now. Sorry about that. And post that on the frequently asked question. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next question. If we have a current Section 4 grant under Health and Housing. Would we be eligible to apply in this round under Section 4 for Health and Housing? Uh, we'd be able to apply under that same program area. Okay. Next, are you expecting the LOI to be an overview of the project, or do you require specifics? So since the LOI narrative is only three pages long, um, you know, I think we realize that all of all details probably won't fit into that. Um, if your organization is invited to submit a full application, we'll be asking you to provide more details. However, if you feel the details that you want to put in are compelling and will, you know, advance your proposals advances, then absolutely include that information, keeping in mind of the page limitations. Next question, could be a recommended fiscal agent for an organization that is a new nonprofit with no formal staff? Um, I mean, so, um, unfortunately, we don't have a, um, a list of organizations that, that could potentially serve as a fiscal agent or a fiscal sponsor. Um, if you want to send uh, an email to the RFP at enterprisecommunity.org mailbox, we could relate it around internally to see if there is perhaps a resource online or if anyone has any connections in any of our markets. Um, there, there are probably, sorry, this is Marie, so there are probably, um, you could do a search online to find um, organizations or consultants that could provide that, those types of services to you. So I would suggest that there's somewhere in your local area um, that you could reach out to. Maybe a partnership with another CDC is also a good um, a good fit for them. Then our question: I'm with a tri tribal housing entity working with three different pueblos. Just to clarify, we can 
submit one proposal, so no need to choose one community to work with, correct? If you're funded for a program from another organization under your chosen program area, will that enhance or detract from a decision to fund your proposal? Can you question, Donna? Sure. If you're funded for a program from another organization under your chosen program area, Will that enhance or detract from a decision to fund your proposal? No. It will not enhance nor detract? No. It, it, it will not detract. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to clarify. Uh, next question. Chosen organizational capacity building as your subject area, which is internally oriented, how do you influence racial equity in a meaningful way? Some grantees in the Atlantic region who have taken a kind of inward, introspective look at their organization. They're actually organizing um, in-house trainings and and related to uh, examining um, implicit, uh, implicit, you know, bias and, and, and things like that that could help the employees themselves uh, be more sensitive and address the issues of, of racial equity. So kind of took that idea and, and kind of turned it inward um, related to, you know, trainings and issues. Mr. Wayne, the one thing I would say is that the end game is important. You're to build capacity of your organization to affect outcomes. And so in, in building the capacity of your staff, how will that help you then turn address uh, conditions in your community or systemic conditions that you think are affecting racial inequities uh, that you could have a positive influence? Great. Our question. Page 5 of the request for LOI includes the term systems equity, but I do not see a definition of this. Can you address this? Wayne, would you like to take that? Um, I'm not sure where they're referencing systems equity, so I don't want to misdirect in terms of that particular reference. Swing back to that one. Sounds good. We have another racial equity question, um, which I just lost. I'm sorry. Give me one quick second here. Oh, I apologize. There, sorry. Uh, in terms of racial equity, can it be addressed at the program level or is it to be addressed at the capacity building level? Level. The way that the LOI is structured currently, you can do, you can uh, actually use either or both of those approaches. Uh, options are at different stages of development, and so um, you just want to be sure to articulate where you are putting your emphasis. If you're doing taking on the program, you that you know would want to describe how you programmatically can do that, and you probably would want to characterize. Uh, the organization is situated to make strong effort in that way. Okay. Um, let's see. A couple easier questions. Is the funding for one year or multi year? So um, the period of performance for grants, um, like we said, it'll either generally be a 12 to 24 month um, period of performance, but that will be set by enterprise uh, staff depending on um, those projects and award amount level, I would say. Okay. And will awards be distributed equally amongst target areas? 
I say no. Um, no. Funds be issued to the top scoring proposals, regardless of which program area they address. There's no hmm. funds for each program area. Can photo affordable housing developer and management organization request grant funds for renovation and repairs of existing affordable housing? Good, but just be aware that any um, funds that are going to be used for construction or rehab and repair will the organization will be required to have an environment a HUD environmental review you done in advance before funds can be committed. You won't be able to receive grant, uh, a committed grant until you've already had an environmental review done. Okay. Should apply if I'm not in a priority area? So say applicants um, still have a chance to receive a grant even if you're not in one of the Thirteen market areas that we've identified. Okay. Uh, question: If applying under Program Area Five, Organizational Sustainability, is it necessary to propose a specific project, or can LOI focus on the organization's growth and improved capability to carry out projects during the term of the grant? you as to how to apply for funding. Um, you look at your organization structure and where you are and specifically what you want to fund and as long as it's eligible in activity under the program, feel free to submit a response. Okay. Can you describe the distinction between new line of business and capacity building. If an organization would like to increase their capacity to assist communities in ways that it previously had not. One more time, Donna. Can you type the distinction between quote new line of business? And capacity building, if an organization would like to increase their capacity to assist communities in ways that it previously had not. If you send that question to the RFP mailbox, because I think we have some follow-up questions that need to be addressed before we can answer that. Can an organization apply for a design grant from Enterprise at the same time as applying for this grant? Yeah, that's allowable, but we would encourage you to, um, if you are able to submit a full proposal, and if you receive a grant award, that we'd cover the same costs. Mm -hmm. Question, can you repeat and correct if necessary this stipulation that you mentioned? If we have a pending application with LISC or anyone else, then we cannot get this grant for the same funding area? So, oh. so that, um, what we mean is that we cannot fund the same project that is uh, being funded by LISC or Habitat. We can't, both organizations can't cover the same cost. Right. It's about the cost overlap. We can't both be paying for the same exact cost. It's coming from the same place. Okay. Next question. My project is eligible under the rural set-aside and the Southern California geographic area. Is it better or more appropriate to apply for the rural instead of the Southern California geographic area? Um, unfortunately, we can't tell you which geography to apply under. Um, we mentioned that um, in the market priority supplement that some 
smart areas are hosting separate Q&A sessions. Um, so it would probably be a good idea if you're available to attend the Rural and Native American webinar and the Southern California webinar. And then depending on what their priorities are, you can determine which program areas are best fit for your organization and your proposed project. Okay. Next one. Can inked construction costs ever be included? We do workforce development that includes on-the-job training on construction projects on historic buildings already approved by SP SHPO. Yeah, one more time, please. Uh, can indirect con construction costs ever be included? We do workforce development that includes all the job training on construction projects on historic buildings already approved by SHPO. Yes, that would be considered a, an eligible cost. Okay. Next, in terms of project-specific affordable housing within program area two, is preference between rental and home ownership development? That would be a great question to send to the RFP mailbox if you don't mind, and then we'll post the response on the updated FAQ at the end of the week. Okay. The organization's mission is already focus on the African-American population, is there a need to elaborate on the racial equity question? This is Wayne. I think you, you do want to articulate how you think um, you'll be able to specifically improve outcomes, uh, like the outcomes for the population you're working with. Uh, we saw from last year's round of submissions where a lot of people were having a real uh, opportunity to affect racial equity, but weren't uh, articulating that in their in their description. And there was a lost opportunity to kind of make a stronger case of why their grant was competitive. Um, and so I think uh, you know you would want to explain the connection may seem obvious. You you would want to explain what you think you're going to be able to impact by doing the work you do. Great. Next question. Can the money cover personnel currently funded by an Enterprise Section 4 grant? Yes, but not for the same project, not for the same specific activities, right? But yes, as long as you're not duplicating costs, then that's eligible. Okay. Next, must organization be certified as a CDC or CHOTO or simply fit the criteria? If we must be certified, may we certify after we submit the LOI or the full proposal? There's certification for, CD, for a CDC. So as long as you meet the criteria of a CDC, you can, you're considered a CDC. As far as a CHOTO, there is a certification. Um, specific to being a CHOTO, and you would need to have that before you uh, grant an award. Okay. Next, we are a small CDC that focuses on local economic development in partnership with affordable housing developers. Because housing is not directly part of our work, would we be eligible to apply directly in support of the economic development partnership? criteria, then you'd be eligible to apply. All right. Next we serve primarily immigrant population in many of our programs and would be interested in providing cultural trainings to our staff so that they can improve their provision of services to the community. Uh, we want to request funding for initiative relative to the sustainability of our building. Do these two requests need to be aligned? Uh, 
send that question to the RFP email so they can, yeah, we can uh, give a better response, I think, if we have a, have a little bit of time. Sure. And maybe, Diane, if you could bring up the slide that has that address. I think that would be helpful. The last one. Great, thanks. <laughs> oh, um, so to follow up on the 12 to 24 month project, can we propose a specific timeline? Yes. You can. Okay. Yes. All righty. And on equity, could we use funding to do research on racial equity outcomes related to affordable home ownership. For example, could we re research how many children of our homeowners completed high school and college and relate this to similar non-owner occupied households? To be able to tie, tie that to how you're building the capacity of your organization. And how are you how are you going to use that research which will be funded by the grant? Implement that. And Can you clarify what specific types of activities are included in creative placemaking, mass planning, and neighborhood revitalization? In other words, can this include policy advocacy, organizing community forums, et cetera? Advocacy are not eligible expenses, so those would not be um, able to be, it would not be able to be used for any sort of policy or advocacy. Oh. A request for funding 100% administrative costs allowable. I think, yeah. can you question to the mailbox too, just to make sure we fully understand the question? Yeah, we. We need to understand what you mean by administrative. Okay. Uh, looking back at LISC again, would we still be eligible if we have an application to LISC for a pre-development grant for a specific affordable housing project, whereas this grant is for general capacity building? Fine, as long as the costs aren't duplicated. Okay. Is the grant project specific? Can it be for single family housing development? It meets the 80% AMI or lower criteria, yes. Oh. Next, if we're applying for costs of redevelopment activities for a property rehab, HUD environmental review be required as part of this grant? Redevelopment cost. No, it's not. Uh, environmental is not required for pre development cost. Okay. We also currently an enterprise grantee within that. Excuse me, again. We are also currently an enterprise grantee within the grant period that began this year. Can we apply for this grant as long as the ask does not overlap what we are already currently receiving funds for? Okay. Give me a second. I am for some of the, that I've overlooked here. Oh. Can funds be used to increase the capacity 
capacity of an organization to raise unrestricted revenue, for example, by starting an income-generating enterprise or building market-rate housing. So Section 4 dollars wouldn't directly benefit L people, but improve capacity of the organization to do so. No. All right. Uh, does the census tract median income have to be below the county AMI? Your question again? Yeah. Sure. Does the census tract median income have to be below the county AMI? I think that would be another great question to send to the RF mailbox, if you don't mind. Okay. And also a related question. Um, what does it mean to live in a census tract that is 51% at or that, excuse me, it means to live in a census tract that 51% is at or below 80% AMI? What tool would we use to identify that? Okay, you guys are stumping us, so honestly, <laughs> um, send, send that to the mailbox, please, and we will, we will get back to you. Okay. Research is pro a little research on our part is probably um, needed. So we just want to make sure that we answer the questions fully. So that's why you hear some long pauses uh, because we want to want to make sure. Okay. Are grants available for new development community housing? Or what you mean by new development community housing. Um, if you could send that question to the mailbox, the RF mailbox, and let us know what you mean by that, then we can give you an answer. Okay. Next question. In order to apply for the Section 4 grant, does the proposal need to include a housing development project or a project that leads to home ownership? If not, would an agency that provides workforce development training to increase assets be eligible? Keep the question one more time, please, Donna. Sure. In order to apply for the Section 4 grant, does the proposal need to include a housing development project or a project that leads to home ownership? If not, would an agency that provides workforce development training to increase assets be eligible? As long as you the criteria of a C or Chodo or uh, definition or the criteria for the Native American organization and or and it building your capacity to um, benefit income people, then that would be eligible. It necessarily have to result in home ownership. What third def definition does enterprise use to designate a 501c3 as a CDC? There are specific criteria listed in the request for letters of interest that identifies um, what must be in order to be considered a CDC. And having 501c3 status is one of those criteria. It's all in the grant guide, which is posted okay. on our website. <laughs> okay. Can you apply what you define as preserving, quote, public housing, unquote? Can you apply to units with other subsidy types, in other words, scattered site 
replacement, et cetera? So that's, I think it would be a question, um, if you could send that to the RFP mailbox. I think that would be through to go. Already. Is there a funding cap to individual grant awards under this round? If not, is there a typical award amount that an applicant should be aware of in determining its request? Anticipate making awards that range in the amount of twenty-five thousand to a hundred thousand, and we also anticipate that the average award amount will be forty thousand. Okay. We move the current enterprise letterhead and replace it with the organization applied in the LOI narrative. In the instructions, oh. it states to complete the top section. I want you to complete the top section that asks for your organization's name and program area, et cetera. You can remove the enterprise header, but add your organization's header. Oh. Wonder Collaborative that passes through funds directly to CDCs and CHOTOs eligible to apply for funds? Yes. Considered a CDC or a CHOTO, then yes. Okay. Is funding cap to individual grant awards under this round? There is a funding cap, but for submitting your applications, um, we would just encourage you to be realistic with the grant award ask that you're making. We anticipate making our average award of $50,000. Okay. If the station has several projects in the ground, can these all be used as opposed to one specific project? Sorry, can you the question? If the organization has several projects in the ground, can all of these be used as opposed to one specific project? So I find if your proposal um, is for multiple projects, I think that's fine. Okay. Architectural and design costs for a proposed LIHTC project eligible? Is there anywhere we can view previously funded projects? Yeah, we have some case studies um, posted on our website, but something that we'll add to the FAQ list, so um, that'll be updated by this Friday and on our website. some indication of a typical amount per recipient under this round? We're anticipating that the average award will be $40,000. Okay. Let's see, give me one second. I'm trying to scare up some questions here. Uh, we're curious if organizations not within the list of priority locations will still have a strong chance of getting accepted through this grant. Yes, I'd still you have a strong chance of receiving uh, the invitation to submit a full proposal. So again, accepting applications from organizations that are operating nationwide. However, we are pri prioritizing those 13 market areas. But just because you're prioritizing those doesn't mean that you don't have a chance of receiving an application if you don't fall within one of those defined market geographic areas. Okay. Can it go toward general operating expenses? Yes, yes eligible. Okay. Looks like I have hit the bottom of the list, uh, but I'm sure that there are more questions on the way. 
So to take a minute and remind everyone that this session has been recorded. So if you missed any part of it or simply want to review, because there's a lot of information, uh, link and an email will be going out to um, anyone who registered and, and or attended. And you should be getting that within approximately 48 hours. And that will have uh, the recording and also a copy of the slides. Let's see what else we've got here. Two seconds here. Uh, let's see. Oh, if a, it would non housing CDC. One that does economic development, for example, would that be eligible? It depends on the project that they are proposing and whether or not it meets uh, eligible criteria, but I wouldn't say that automatically disqualifies you from applying. Can you provide examples of the types of activities included in creative placemaking, master planning, and neighborhood revitalization? We will add that to the FAQ list. We'll add one when we put those on Friday. Okay. Let's see. We have to be certified as a CHODO before we submit either the LOI or the proposal or just by the time we are awarded the grant. Anticipate a start date of September 1st. I would say that you would need to have that certification prior to September 1st. Um, and regarding creative placemaking, which category includes that creative placemaking? Which program area? Uh, well, the question was which category includes creative placemaking? Uh, program Area 1, Building and Designing Sustainable Communities. It's all in our um, Rural and Native American Supplement under Promoting Housing and Resiliency in Communities of Opportunity. I may have already answered this question, but I'm going to read it out again. Uh, the request for funding 100% of administrative costs allowable, in other words, organizational operating expenses. So organizational operating expenses are eligible if that's what you mean by administrative costs. Okay. We have a supportive housing program with funding that was affected by HUD cuts this year. Would, would we be eligible to request general operating for this supportive housing program under Perm Area 3? Can you read it one more time? Sure. Thanks. If we, <clears throat> excuse me. If we have a supportive housing program with funding that was affected by HUD cuts this year, would we be eligible to request general operating support for this supportive housing program under Program Area 3? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Could it be used to create a community level plan? That's eligible. Okay. 
waiting for more to come in. Just a reminder also that when you do leave the session today, you'll be taken to a very, very brief uh, and we would love to get your response because it really does help us make live online events useful and relevant for all of our participants. So it shouldn't take you more than four minutes. It would be greatly appreciated. I also remind everybody that if you go to our website and look at the grants guide, we'll give you more information regarding eligible and ineligible costs and provides examples also. And those examples are also in um, one of our resource guides it's called uh, Full Application and Grant Award Requirements. Okay. Here's one. Uh, for rural, rural and Native American, is the program area for help sustaining the organization, quote, multi-year capacity building for Native American communities, unquote, does it include rural that is not Native American? The program area is only for Native American communities. Okay, terrific. And I believe there is also a rural and Native American specific webinar coming up. Is that listed on the website as well? Yes, um, on the website, and it's also in the rural and Native American priority supplement. Excellent. Thank you for those plugs. It's at 3 o'clock Eastern tomorrow. Terrific. Okay. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Good. I was going to say, um, so we can go back to the communities of opportunity question. So we're defining that as um, where you're working to provide access to jobs, school, transit, and health care. Development of a green space in new transit-oriented development counts as, a, as capacity for serving tenants? Our time, Donna. Was the development of a green space in a new transit-oriented development is capacity for serving tenants? I think that it could. The tenants who were served fall in the debt of low income. That's one requirement. Okay. Uh, and a related question, what samples of activities would count as building organizational capacity? So there are a few examples in the LOI. Um, so it could be improved board oversight and governance, strategic partnerships, um, increased capacity for preservation of affordable housing, um, act that will strengthen the financial health and long-term sustainability of the organization, thereby increasing its impact. Um, so on page 11 of LOI, where Program 5, Organizational Sustainability, begins, you can read more um, about that program area there and the fuels that are listed. Okay. Would participating in a city's community plan update process count as master planning? I need more information about the proposed activities, so I want to send your question um, to the RFP mailbox. That would be great. Right. We'll probably get a few more in, but we're definitely starting to slow down a little bit. Um, while we're waiting, 
Kate or our other uh, presenters today, do we have any other th last things that you want to get across to all of our attendees? I, um, we heard everything um, in the <laughs> webinar, but you know, um, we encourage everyone to review the LOI again and all of the resource guides. Um, you know, we can advise on where you should apply under or which market area you should apply under, um, and we really can't tell you which um, activities um, to apply for. Um, if you have questions, the RFP at enterprisecommunity.org mailbox is your best bet. If you have questions about um, a specific market priority, uh, contact information for that market is listed in their supplement. So that would be another good resource for applicants. But we're looking forward to reading all of the applications that come in. And remember to see to look to see if there is a another webinar for the specific market that you are um, anticipating applying for. Okay. And we do have another question that's come in. Um, are partial requests funded? For example, if the request is for seventy thousand, would you determine the proposal to be eligible to be for fifty thousand? That happened. Okay. Right. Just another second or so. Come to the transom. Looking pretty quiet. Okay. We, uh, I think we're going to have a, just a few extra minutes on, on the end here. So, uh, Kate, let me know if there's anything you need to add. Otherwise, I will uh, get us caught for the day. Yep, I think good. Thanks for attending, everyone. Thank you to our panelists, and good luck.